I'm Whitney Adams from the Whitney A Channel coming to you from the WSWA TV studios at the 74th annual WSWA Convention and Exposition here in Orlando. And today I am joined by Louise McGuan from Chapel Gate Irish Whiskey. Hello, Louise. Hi, great to be here. Lovely to have you. I've heard a lot of great things about you and JJ Corey, so I'm Thank really excited you. to meet you. Uh, is this your first time here at WSWA event? I was here about 15 years ago. I have a long history in the industry, so I was yes. here a very long time ago in a very different guise. You were working in marketing for, for big brands all over the world, really. I think you were in Paris and Singapore and New York. Yeah, I, I did New York, Paris, London and Singapore. Wow. Yeah, with Diageo, Perno and Moet Hennessy. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a really interesting uh, part of my career, for sure. But you've definitely taken a total uh, turn and gone back to your family farm in Ireland just a few years ago to develop your own brand and resurrect the lost art of Irish whiskey bonding. If you could tell us a little bit about what that is and how your brand is doing that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I moved back from Singapore. I was working with Diageo and I packed it all in to go back to my roots essentially. Um, I'm the world's only Irish whiskey bonder. Believe Amazing. It or not. <laughs> An incredible I, title. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll be the last, but I am currently the world's only whiskey bonder. And what whiskey bonding means in the context of Irish whiskey, um, it, it's effectively the way that all Irish whiskey used to be sold up until the 1930s. Distilleries back then effectively only, they acted as wholesalers, if you like. Right. There were hundreds of distilleries all over Ireland, and bonders were sort of mercantile owners or grocers. Mm -hmm. They sold everything in their shop from gun parts, ammunition, flour, um, just general supplies, but also alcohol. They would have supplied, you know, everything from gin, rum, sherry, port, and wine. Another daily essential. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and also whiskey. And the way that they handled the whiskey was they would just take whatever casks they had lying around in their shop, once they were empty, uh, they would bring them to the local distillery, because there was hundreds of distilleries in Ireland, you know, about 100 years ago. Uh, they'd fill them up and then they'd bring them back to their shop to mature or their farm to mature. Then they'd custom blend um, for their for the individual customers. And because about 80% of whiskey's flavor comes from the cask it's aged in and the right. environment in which that, that cask is aged, this meant that there was once a huge variety of regional flavor in Irish whiskey. Much like wine. Precisely, yeah, there, there, there is that element. Um, that all died out in the 1930s because mm -hmm. the Irish whiskey industry collapsed. Uh, we went from having about 200 distilleries in 1890 to having four by 1930. Wow. So the distillers sort of shut up shop and started to, to control the route to market and the bonders were all cut off. So the, the, the practice completely died out. And um, it's been that way ever since until December 1st, 2016, we accepted our first delivery of casks onto our family farm into our bonded rack house. That must have been a very exciting day. Um, that was a huge day. That was <laughs> yeah. a huge day. My, you know, my, my dad still farms that farm. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I rent that piece of a field off of him to have that rack house on there. So he was there. The friends and neighbors were there. They've all been trained how to handle casks. You know, it was, uh, it was a lot of work to get to that point. Um, but now that whiskey is, is sitting uh, in that rack house and it's maturing away very nicely and being influenced by our little microclimate right by the ocean. He must be very proud of you. He is, but you know, he's a tough Irish dad as well. You know, he, he calls me out and challenges me on, on a lot of stuff, but I think he, yeah, he Keeping is. Keeping you humble. It, exactly, he keeps me down to earth, there's no doubt about it. Well, one thing that's very impressive is your crowdfunding campaign that you did back in 2015. Um, and I think you raised 125% of your goal. Do you have some advice for other brands doing something similarly? Like, how did you stand out and why do you think it was so successful? Yeah, I, I used, crowdfunding quite tactically. Mm -hmm. I used it to test the concept and the story. So mm -hmm. the, the, the JJ Corey brand is a real, you know, he was a, he was a whiskey bonder locally to me in the 1890s. He's a real guy. He's distantly related to me, my father alleges, but he was a real person. Okay. You know, before I came here, I actually went to his grave with a bottle to say, look, we're, we're doing this. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he's a real person, he was a real person, and um, I knew that there was a really nice story in that, that JJ Carr was a bonder, I'm gonna bring bonding back. How are people gonna react to that? Mm -hmm. So I used crowdfunding as a means to tell that story about JJ Carr, about the family farm, and about the idea of bonding, and I wanted to see what people um, buy into it. I spent a little bit of money on a video, I got my messaging down, mm -hmm. 
and I looked at what other corresponding um, brands or, or, or similar you know, crowdfund raises had done in, in this particular space. And I, I set my, you know, my target at you know, something that had already been achieved by a few other brands, which was realistic. Smart. Exactly. And then I had killer rewards is another thing that you have to do. You know, I had a stay at our house in Ireland. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had, I had really tiny things, like we would light a candle for you in the local church, which cost me nothing. And I had hats and I had bits and pieces, but I had really unique rewards that, that people sort of bought into. And then I just pushed the heck out of it on social media. I built up a big following on social media about four months prior, it took a lot of work. And then I hit up the whiskey media and I hit up the consumer media once we started going. And then it just ramped up. So if you, kinda, if you look at it like that and realize your crowdfund is a full-time job right. for several months, then, then you'll get there. You have to be realistic about it. Yeah, very creative um, ways to do that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the branding here. Yes. Um, and I think you know it really ties into you telling a story and how that connects with consumers, and that's really great marketing initiative and very smart. Um, so let's talk about the branding behind it and also how you're marketing it here in the United States, um, on-premise, off-premise, et cetera. Sure, so, so the branding is essentially, uh, and it's an evolution, if you like, if, of the original label. So the, this is the original label here, um, from the 1890s. I have original versions of it at home, myself. Right. And um, you know, that's what JJ Carr used. So we, we, we looked at that and we said, okay, how can we modernize that? How can we just bring it forward a little bit? So we very much yeah. took the influence from, from that. We added premium cues with some gold foils, some debossing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and we, 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 I had the, the shamrock, for example, hand drawn by a pen artist, just like it would have been back then, and that it's kind of beautiful. thing. It's beautiful. Yeah, so it, it's coming out quite nicely. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our price point is a super premium price point, so it has to have those good quality cues. You know, the label is always a real wrestle. There are days when I think I should have just gone with that label, the original label, and I'm not ruling that out. I may at some point have a special release with just the original label on it, exactly. which would be very cool. But there does come a point where you have to go, all right, we got to go. Right. Um, the, 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 this, first, this first release from us is called The Gale. Um, and it's named after a bicycle, which is why there's a bicycle here. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. And so JJ Carey invented a bicycle called The Gale. So The Gale. OK. Yeah, in the, in the 1890s. He was the chairman of the local bicycling, bicycling club, which is kind of the equivalent of like owning a Tesla today. It was super modern, super ah, progressive. Okay. So I know that he invented a bicycle called the Gale. I have mm -hmm. evidence of, and documentary evidence of that. So I figured in homage to JJ, we'd, uh, we'd name it after his bicycle, essentially. Excellent. Um, it'll be, uh, my, my, this is obviously mature whiskey. Right. I have my Irish whiskey. It has to age for a minimum of three years aging on the farm. And then in the interim, just like all the whiskey bonders mm -hmm. used to do, I am sourcing mature stock. Got it. So I have sources, I'm, you know, I'm well connected now within the Irish whiskey sourcing situation in Ireland. Um, it's very rare stock, it's difficult to track down. Mm -hmm. But I have a source now of 10, 15 and 25 year old single malt and seven, eight and nine year old grain whiskey. So that's my current stock and I'm blending that and I'm creating something unique, uh, you know, out of, of the stock that I have. And that's what we're going to market with first. Okay. Very transparently. Our model is bonding. Our model is not distilling. We don't claim to distill. Right. We 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 source whiskey from from elsewhere, and we blend and we create something new. Right. And what what advice would you give to a, another small startup or an international brand that's trying to break into the U.S. market, and and how WSWA can help um, with a brand like that? Yeah. I, I think here uh, you. I've worked, I've worked in this market, so I've had a, I have a broad understanding right. of the markets, right? Um, and that is a huge advantage to me. People have a very difficult time grasping the three-tier system mm -hmm. because it's, it's very unique. So my right. advice would be for import brands is that you have to spend time here. You have to spend a serious amount of time trying to understand the market. You have to know the difference between a franchise state, a controlled state, and an open state. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you're in trouble. Um, you really have to study this market more than any other market. <laughs> this is the only market that matters for Irish whiskey. You know, you know, it's it's this is it. There's the trends are made here, but the system can it, it can really very easily trip you up if you go in there thinking 
magic is going to happen just by you know sending four pallets over. <laughs> it's not. Right. Uh, you need boots on the ground. You need to invest in this market. Uh, that's the expectation. You know, it's it's hyper competitive. So be realistic when you when you approach this market. I would say. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. I really look forward to seeing the evolution of this brand. It's I think it's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Chase. Thanks. Thanks. And thank you for watching WSWA TV.